the Conservatives are the largest party. They don't have an overall majority at this stage. The Prime Minister called this election because she wanted certainty and stability. This doesn't seem to look like certainty and stability. Welcome to Polling Politics. This episode is sponsored by Smarkets. I'm Joe Twyman, co-founder and director of Delta Poll. And I'm freelance journalist Marie Leconte. Our guest this week is Lisa Nandy, the MP for Wigan. Hello. Hello. Lisa's been Labour MP for Wigan since 2010. She's worked as Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change and was co-chair of Owen Smith's leadership campaign. Before entering politics, Lisa worked for organisations like Centrepoint and the Children's Society. Lisa, thanks for joining us. Inevitably, of course, we're going to have to start discussing Brexit. Uh, Theresa May's on tour. This was described by the DUP as a propaganda tour. But I'm interested to know what other types of tours politicians do. I mean, isn't it, isn't it always a farewell a, one? <laughs> <laughs> has, is this has a comment any, on me particularly? Or? <laughs> has any politician ever done a farewell tour? <laughs> and exactly how well did it go down? I like the idea. That was just being like, you know, I am about to leave politics because I'm done with this shit. So like, come see me one last time if you like me. But no, in, <laughs> instead on her uh, instead on her tour, we're hearing the same things over and over and over again. It's the only deal. It's the best deal possible. It's in the national interest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Michael Fallon most recently has come out to say that the deal is doomed and represents the worst of all worlds. Lisa, what do you think? Well, I think that Michael Fallon and Theresa May have some past history that might inform why he's so cross about the deal and about Theresa May as well. The withdrawal agreement isn't the problem, actually. The withdrawal agreement is 585 pages of dense legal gold, text, of gold. which has ruined the last two weeks of my life, as I've not only had to read it, but been carting it up and down the country, which is not doing much for my back and um is that why you're in a full body cast <laughs> yes yes that's okay, exactly why right. i was going to ask but, you know. <laughs> and um and the withdrawal agreement isn't the problem actually the problem is the political declaration that goes alongside it it's basically 26 pages of nothing very much it doesn't offer any guide to the future and the future relationship is key because it will determine whether we go down a China or US style economy with low wages and low taxes and low regulations or whether we tack close to the EU. So the problem is the the lack of clarity about where next because the withdrawal agreement gives Theresa May permission to then go off and negotiate what our future relationship with the EU looks like and that will have profound consequences for people in my town in Wigan and across the country and yet with only a few days to go until she's asking us to vote for both of those things and to give her permission to go off and negotiate that future relationship we've got no clarity at all about what comes next. Would you advise Theresa May to make Wigan a stop on her propaganda tour? No we've got enough problems without a Tory (laughs) Prime Minister frankly coming and apparently listening although there's been very little listening very little attempt to reach out over the last two and a half years what I I would really like though is a a level of honesty and level of clarity from the government about what they're trying to do next I mean essentially what she's trying to do for understandable political reasons within the Tory party is fudge the future relationship she's trying not to give any concrete clues as to what she's going to do next before the withdrawal agreement is passed but the truth is that that's far too big a gamble to ask people to take and she's going to have to set out in some detail where she sees the future of Britain lying if she's got any hope of getting this thing through the House of Commons. And what hope do you think she has uh, with the vote approaching on the 11th of December? Well it depends on what she does so One thing that she could do, for example, is she could seek to give Parliament a say in what comes next. She could allow us a meaningful vote on the future relationship, which we haven't even really started negotiating with the EU. What she could do is try to build a consensus out in the country. Parliament is divided because the public's divided. In Ireland, for example, they use citizens' assemblies to good effect to break constitutional deadlock. We could do something similar in the UK. A lot of people have said there isn't time, and it's true that the timing is very tight, but we're not leaving until the end of March 2019. And it is possible to seek an extension from the EU that would take us up to the European elections. I mean, that's basically their red line and where they 
you, you know, where they, they see the cutoff for an extension of Article 50, but it is possible to buy a bit more time in order to try and get this right. And I, I always have in my mind the fact that we had a decision to close the coal mines in Wigan that was made 40 years ago, and we still deal with the fallout of that now. We've got endemic and entrenched child poverty in some parts of the community. We've got the ill health and the economic impact that went with that. If you don't get these things right, then you deal with the consequences for a very long time. And this is one of those moments. That's why, you know, I'd always said from the very beginning, I would approach this deal with an open mind. But the truth is, we haven't got a deal on offer. We've got a legal text and very little else besides. Donald Trump has been uh, has been his usual helpful self, professionally trolling Theresa May by saying that the deal looks like a good deal for Europe and uh, the EU and uh, and will uh, damage dealings with America. Though uh, the American ambassador to Britain, Woody Johnson, has sort of rolled back on that a bit. Uh, and also he's called Woody Johnson, which I think we just need to take a second to think about because that's a very funny name. And we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Trump, helpful in this process? Well... Helpful in the sense that it gives you a clue as to where he and the sort of libertarian wing of the Tory party are trying to go with some of this, which is heading the UK to a situation where we have no deal at all with the EU and where we then have a free-for-all. We try and strike a trade deal with the US on the same terms that they trade with other parts of the world, which would take us down that low wage, low tax, low regulation economy route and be really disastrous for a lot of my constituents who are employed in the um, the construction industry, in factories, particularly in food manufacturing, in, on the railways, things like health and safety laws, for example, that we negotiated with the EU that apply, that don't apply if you're trading with the US, that have literally kept my constituents alive over the last 20, 30, 40 40 years and all of those things are potentially about to be junked in favor of trade deals with the US and China and other similar economies and in a way it is helpful for Trump to have intervened at this stage because it gives you a clue as to what they're trying to do and it throws the onus back to parliament to make sure that we avoid the potential of no deal but this is where the real problem lies because in a few weeks time it looks very likely that we're going to vote down all of the alternatives to this withdrawal agreement and then we're going to vote down the withdrawal agreement itself and unless we get our act together and agree on an alternative we're going to leave on the 29th of March with no deal at all that is the legal default and there is a complacency in Westminster about that I've heard colleagues on all sides of the house saying that parliament has to come together and sort this out that parliament will find a way to avoid no deal. But so far, there is no concrete plan as to how that is going to happen. And unless we do something in the next few months, we're going to go down that Donald Trump nightmarish vision. And that is a failure of collective leadership that has got to be resolved in the next few weeks. But I think so coming back on the vote, I think that number 10 has kind of been playing its cards really badly. They started briefing out effectively saying, well, we know we might lose a vote and then we go back to the EU, get some cosmetic changes to the agreement and then kind of come back and hopefully they'll pass. But it's like, it's one of those stupid things like, well, why why brief that? Why leak that? Because in that case, you're giving actually MPs a way to be like, okay, well, the first vote doesn't matter. So I can definitely vote down the first one. And then because we know there'll be a second vote anyway. So that's kind of like the fake one. But then now I think we're seeing numbers. Because I think originally the number 10 sources was like, if we lose by like 20 votes, we can definitely get away with that. But now it's looking like it might be lost by about 200 votes. Because yeah, MPs are just like, yeah. Dunn in the Sun said a loss of 200 <laughs> votes, which is which is not great by uh But by it just measure. feels so boneheaded. If you've got a very good secret plan... Why not keep it secret? <laughs> it's just politics 101. I, I feel like I shouldn't be saying that as a journalist, but I'm like, come on. Generally like, speaking, se- very good secret plans tend to be less good once they're not secret anymore. In terms of the narratives that the Prime Minister is putting out there, that it's the only deal, that it's the best deal, that it's in the national interest, the polling suggests that's really not resonating with the uh, with the public. There's clearly a lot of confusion. There's clearly a lot of room for manoeuvre and a lot of information lacking. But don't worry, we have a TV debate potentially coming. <laughs> <laughs> Public support it by a margin of about two to one. (sighs) 
What the fuck, the public? Well, it's because when it's because people think that would be a, a good idea. It doesn't mean they'd actually watch it. I was going to say, two to one will not be watching this <laughs> TV <laughs> Although debate. Although the suggestion is that it will come before the I'm a celebrity, get me out of here grand final. Now, I think there's a real opportunity there to combine the two. And so Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn have three minutes to make their point, but then they have to eat a kangaroo's anus. I don't know, man. I feel like I've been campaigning you don't know? personally. You don't think for... that's a good idea? No, I want a gun stank. I want a normal <laughs> debate with a gun stank. Either that or, you know, the massive, like, cotton buds, like, thingies you can fight with. That Just was make it attractive. Yeah. Lisa, what do you think about a TV debate? With what? With the jungle? With cotton buds? Are they, with whichever what? you what want. Whichever yeah. one you want. to be decided. I think, the pub, I think Theresa May's strongest card with all of this is that a lot of people are really fed up and would really like to see us come together and resolve things. The difficulty with a TV debate is, I mean, fine, have a TV debate if people want a TV debate, but I think that it will create more heat and very little light. And that has been the problem all along. Over the last two and a half years, we've become more entrenched. The noise has got louder. The screams of betrayal from both extreme ends of this debate have crowded out any pragmatic voices in the centre and I think most of the public just feel thoroughly sick of the whole thing. Well it's funny you should mention that. Jack Fincham, winner of Love Island, he said as if he knew that, uh, he told uh, he told Jeremy Vine that he voted leave in the EU referendum simply because his family told him to and added, in terms of now, I don't really have an opinion on it, I just want everyone to stop arguing about it and for it all to be sorted out. I agree, <laughs> I agree, I'm with Jack. And I think a lot of the public are with him. Uh, he has 2.6 million Instagram followers and is launching his own stationary range. Oh, that's quite nice. <laughs> so you know the guy. The guy clearly knows what he's uh, what he's doing. I really like the sound of this guy. I am obsessed with stationary. Well, his in that case, his new stationary range out now is called Fincham London. Oh, and wow. It sells office essentials, helpfully <laughs> stressing, including pens. <laughs> But so briefly, I'm very sorry to come back on the debate. <laughs> no, no. Well, do you, do you remember, Marie, were you born when, uh, when Farage and Clegg had their debate back in <laughs> April 2014? I do have like vague memories of that, but it probably feels like something that, you know, the elders of the village gathered around the fire and told us ancient stories or ancient tales of a it's so long, different world. It is, it is remarkable. I mean, after that debate on Europe, wow, I mean, wow, can you remember the impact? I've, just, I've sort of just remembered Clegmania, actually, and I'm starting to wonder whether this was ever real or <laughs> whether I've completely misremembered a large chunk of British history. It, it was a thing, I think. I, I, Clegmania was a thing, but that was in 2010 after the debate. But then, obviously believing that he was God's gift to massive debating, Nick Clegg decided to take on Nigel Farage in April 2014 in a debate on Europe. Yeah, I think I've blanked that out. No, it's amazing how few people remember this. I was trying to remember it and I thought, did I actually dream that? <laughs> did I dream that Nigel Farage That's and Nick Clegg had not one but two debates? One televised, one on the radio. Can I, can I make my one serious point now? Because I yes, do sorry, not have I, many opinions you, on yes. Brexit, but I, that is one I have. It's like, I'm not entirely sure how interesting that debate is going to be, because at the end of the day, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn have quite similar visions of the sorts of Brexit they want. It will be different on some detail, but they want an end. You know, they want to get out of the single market, almost certainly the customs union, end of freedom movement, et cetera, et cetera, but also, you know, not the hardest Brexit. So I'm not sure it's the best thing for, like, really for the public to kind of see two people argue over, like, just the, the specifics of Brexit, which are, like, really the most boring bits. This apparently is a debate within the broadcasters because ITV have said they want their head-to-head just before I'm a Celebrity. The BBC want as many as five different people all representing different uh, different sides of the argument. So presumably that would be Andrew Adonis. I understand he's quite interested in Brexit. That's come up a couple of times. It's, it's, It's been mentioned. And then presumably Farage would have to be there since it's a debate about... And maybe oh, no, Nick can Clegg- we not bring back... Hang on, hang on. Can we not bring back... What's his face? Former leader of UKIP who took UKIP into the 2017 election. Or 20- Paul Nuttle? Yeah. yeah, him. That'd be funny. Would it? Yeah. <laughs> He's the, same, he's the same age as me, Paul Nuttall. I, debate, <laughs> I debated Paul Nuttall quite a lot in the first referendum and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that this is going to get us very far, to be honest. I mean, the trouble is that this is basically the same debate that we've been having for three years, isn't it? I mean, I, mm. three years ago, I was touring the country having a debate about whether we should leave or remain 
in the EU and we're still having it. <laughs> well, it is literally the debate we and, had four years and, ago. And Jack, and Jack and a lot of the country are saying to us, can we just move on? We're sick of it. And yet we're stuck in this endless loop in Westminster where we don't seem to even be trying to win over people who don't agree with us. We're just shouting even louder in our own entrenched positions. And meanwhile, the clock is ticking. We voted to trigger Article 50. We can have a big debate about whether that was the right thing to do or not. But there is a reality here that, doesn't mm. seem to have dawned on a lot of people. UKIP MEP Patrick O'Flynn has defected to, of all people, the SDP over the appointment of the EDL's Tommy Robinson to uh, to UKIP. Now, of course, defecting to the, <laughs> the SDP... British Macron. <laughs> <laughs> defecting to the SDP was a really big thing in the 80s. It hasn't really attracted much attention recently, but... We should keep in mind that the SDP massively increased their vote at the last election. Their vote was up 375%. They went from 125 votes in 2015 to 469 votes in 2017. And they now have two town councillors. <laughs> and Lisa, I have to- <laughs> Lisa, have you considered defecting to the, uh, the SDP or indeed what? the Whigs or Who- the Chartists? <laughs> What who who are the SDP? I don't mean historically. I mean who who are they now? They are the social I checked and it is it it's is a thing. it's the same thing. It's the Social Democratic Party. They still have a presence. As I said, they received nearly five hundred votes at the last election. Is this UKIP guy their leader then? Well, I, I wouldn't like to assume, but he's certainly <laughs> the most famous person in the SDP. Gosh. Yeah, no, and I, I think I, for some reason, vaguely knew that they still existed. Like, haven't they just gone a bit fash? Who knows? Well, let's put it out to both the, both the listeners. If you know anything about the SDP of today, please, uh, please do write in and, uh, and tell us. Answers on a postcard to who the fuck are the SDP at deltapoll.co.uk. <laughs> Sorry, that is a very nerdy thing to say, but that reminds me of one of my favourite ever political, like, general election posters, which is... The Tories, I can't remember when, but we see like an election where the SDP was standing and still something. And it was just a picture of seven bottles of claret. And it said, what are the, in massive letters, what are the SDP's policies? And then tiny letters, if you know, please write into CCHQ and we'll send you a bottle of claret. Which was completely mad. <laughs> just a fucking weird way but, to think. <laughs> but surely then you have to send everyone a bottle of claret, don't you? Assuming that people do think that bothered sending in things to be like, the SDP's policies are... At least I do it for a bottle think, of wine. I but... think this is a highly risky strategy. And we're joined now for our weekly chat with Sarbjit from Smarkets. Hello, Sarbjit. Hi there. So, this week we have once again been discussing the uh, the excitement of Brexit, which inevitably leads to our weekly update on what the markets are showing in terms of Tory leader and uh, who might replace Theresa May. Okay, so this week we have got uh, Boris Johnson back on top. Last traded at 12%. I'm sorry about that, but yep, he's there. Michael Gove is second. Again, just like over 10%. And then Dominic Rabb. But, uh, you know, this market is changing minute by minute. Right, Anything so th- this is the kind of thing that does change on a, on a day-by-day basis. Yeah, yeah. Just if you go to the, the Smarkets website and you look at our charts, it'll just show you the, the amount of trading that's going on and how everyone's um, switching positions. And what about the exit date when Theresa May may fall stroke be removed stroke right off into the sunset okay (laughs) just say fuck off i'm out (laughs) 2019 is still holding strong 2018 has obviously dropped off because there's not much time left in that 2019 is running at about 50 percent, so it looks pretty certain we have a secondary market on what month she'll go and january to march 2019 is the favorite there i don't see why you should leave before march i think why not see it until the end and i think that i don't i think if you've got if you've gone this far Mm. Why not go? But of course, it may not be her choice. That, I think that's the. But we've already nearly had a coup, and they like, they completely <laughs> messed it up. Like they messed up every step of well, the way. Well, practice so- makes perfect. <laughs> you know, they might they might get it sorted out next time. Do you do you never think that just one time she's just going to say, "Look, I've just had enough. I, no, I, 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 I can't wake up and do this for another day, and just decide to leave." Oh god, get on holiday somewhere nice, like the Maldives. Never come back. <laughs> yeah. 
last week we passed the point where it was no longer technically possible to have a general election this year. <laughs> but obviously there's discussion about whether it might happen next year. What are the markets showing on that? So year of next general election, we're showing a very, very strong preference for 2019 <laughs> at 38%. And you've recently launched a series of new markets around the next general election. Tell us about that. Yeah, we're all expecting there to be a, a general election sooner or later. So it's about time we actually got up the markets to see what the public think about how it's going to go. I mean, we've seen some polling come out about this, and it's good to actually test it against our, our own markets. We've got markets on voter turnout, vote share for the different parties, overall majority seats uh, after the next general election, both by the UK and by the nations. And it could potentially be some time until the general election takes place. The polls at this stage are usually not particularly good at, uh, at predicting predicting outcomes. And indeed, they should never be used as a prediction because they're only a snapshot of public opinion at the, uh, at the time. But with time potentially on our side, you can trade in and out of these markets. Can you explain how that works? Sure. I mean, markets is a betting exchange. You're not betting against a bookie who, and you're just accepting that price. If you think that the price of something happening is too high, for instance, the probability of that happening is too high compared to what you think it should be, then you'd say that market is overpriced. So you can bet on either side of that, put in your own prices or take advantage of that price and trade out when that price changes. So it's just like buying something that changes in value over time. If you think something is too, too cheap at the moment and worth more, you can, you can buy an option or you buy that price and then sell it at the time when someone else is willing to pay more for it. And then there's the issue of a TV debate around Brexit. And this, is, uh, this has been a point of some discussion. Do you have a market on that? Yes, we do. We have a market on will there be a televised Brexit debate between Corbyn and May before December 11, 2018. Well, the public are in favour. What do the markets show? They're currently showing a yes. It's a 72% price. So if you don't think that's going to happen, get onto it. But there's, there's many different options for how this might happen. As long as both of them are there, if there's a debate and they're talking to each other, then we'll set it as yes. Thank you, Sabjit. And thank you, Smarkets. Thank you. Our main topic for discussion today is towns. Now, Lisa, you are heavily involved with the Centre for Towns. Tell us about that. So it's a think tank, which is a quite grand name for an operation that we run out of a shed in Bolton, that we set up a few years ago after the EU referendum. It's myself, Ian Warren, who is a data analyst, and Will Jennings, who is an academic at Southampton University, and basically got fed up with people calling our towns left behind after the Brexit vote exposed those huge divisions between towns and cities where cities voted overwhelmingly to remain and nearby towns voted in similarly large numbers to leave. People in our towns have been called stupid, they've been called racist, we've been told that it was a vote of people who had nothing left to lose. Somebody actually described Wigan as a wasteland to me. And was we it got, someone from Wigan? No, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, okay, it, was, uh, it was a trade union leader who got fairly short thrift. And it, it was just actually that he didn't really mean that. He, he'd been to Wigan. He knows it's a perfectly nice, decent place to live. But we'd got caught up in this narrative and we got really fed up with it and decided that we would set up a think tank to start to address some of the reasons why people felt so fed up two and a half years ago that they voted to leave in large numbers, why we've seen this phenomenon in many of our towns previously about the rise in support for UKIP, why before that we'd seen declining turnout in many of those areas. People have been trying to tell us for a very long time that the system isn't working for them in towns like mine. We haven't been paying attention and so we thought, well, you know, when you've got this great big crisis of a divided country and it's a global phenomenon, what do you do? You set up a think tank. So that's what we decided to do. How do you bridge that gap actually between towns and cities? I think the first thing you've got to do is understand why people in towns are so fed up with the political and economic settlement that they've got. So Will did a piece of research that found that people in towns are far more likely to say that politicians don't care about them or their area than people in cities. Over the course of the last 40 years, social attitudes have completely diverged. So it's not just Brexit, where there's a great big gulf now, but also on many of those issues like immigration, social security, 
LGBT rights, civil rights. There's a huge gap between how people feel about those issues in towns and cities. So what we did was a piece of research that looked at the demographic changes that had happened over that time. I was born in Manchester in 1979 and Manchester was, like most cities, much older than the surrounding towns because the towns were where you had industry, you had mines, you had mills. And over the course of those 40 years, as all of that has been closed or disappeared or significantly reduced and successive governments have decided to invest in cities in the hope that the benefits will trickle out to surrounding towns. We've seen a huge loss of working age population in towns. Manchester is now much younger than towns like Wigan, Bolton, Bury that surround it, and that is true across the country. And so towns have aged, cities have got younger, and that is what really accounts for these very big differences. But it's also what accounts for the economic problems that we're seeing in towns. So every time you pick up a newspaper at the moment, you'll see something about high streets and the problems on our high streets. Well, you can trace that directly back to these decisions that have cut the working age population out of those towns, which means that the spending power isn't there, which means not just high streets, but community pubs, bus networks, all of these things have become unsustainable. And it's no surprise that it was my colleague Jo Cox who set up the Commission on Loneliness. She represented Batley and Spen, which is a, an, an area of the country, a constituency that has several small towns in it. And it's in those towns where young people have moved away to find work and found there's nothing to return home to, that you've got a lot of older people now who are growing older without family close by. Their children, their grandchildren live hundreds of miles away. And so all of these problems, you can connect them right back to those decisions not to invest in our towns. And that really is what lies behind the great gulf that we've got. So the answer, the short answer to the question is you've got to get good quality jobs back into our towns, rebuild the working age population, and then you'll start to see some of that gulf disappear. But how do you how do you go about that? So the first group that contacted us when we set up Centre for Towns were the CBI, which was a bit of a surprise. They don't come knocking on Labour's door very often. And we're a cross-party think tank. We, we have no Everyone's um, allowed in the shed. A broad we, uh, shed. Everyone's allowed in the shed as long as they are town <laughs> and they must get town or they're not allowed in. You know, one of the things that they said to us straight away was that they were really interested in the project and the work that we were doing because they see huge potential for growth in towns. So a company like Heinz that's based in Wigan, the reason that they want to be based in Wigan and not in Manchester is because uh, they get much cheaper rents, lots of open space, access to fresh water, which is really important when you're making soup, and good transport links. So although the train network and the bus network is dreadful geographically many towns are better located than cities but the problem that they have is that the infrastructure isn't there so that is number one transport it's also broadband and it's skills as well and the problem really is that for a long time decisions about those things have been made hundreds of miles away from those areas by people in Westminster and Whitehall for whom those areas will never be a priority and frankly who have no skin in the game they don't travel on buses they don't know anything about how people live in those areas they don't see the potential in those areas they only see the problems and so there's a political problem here which is that we've got to move power much closer to people and decision-making much closer to people if we're going to get this right. And that actually was a lot of the sentiment that lay behind the vote to leave the EU, take back control, resonated with people in a way that no other political slogan has in my lifetime. And it spoke very directly to a need for much more power and control over the things that matter in your life. And if you look at the areas that have the highest voting for leave, you see areas like Boston and Skegness, Castle Point, Kingston upon Hull, Doncaster, Walsall, Great Yarmouth, Clacton, Mansfield. You look at the areas that overwhelmingly voted Remain, and you have London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Brighton, Cardiff, Sheffield, Manchester, Bath. Is part of the distinction to do with university towns and cities as well is education part of the problem and part of the solution so university towns and to some extent commuter towns are the only types of towns that have booked this trend the most acute problems that we found are in either seaside coastal towns or in post-industrial areas but across the board the 
division between towns and cities remains. Universities have, have booked the trend largely because it means that young people are still present in those towns. So you have younger people as well as older people, you have a working age population, you have a source of skilled employment as well. You know, there are some areas, for example, Redcar, where they've managed to attract quite a lot of foreign direct investment, which other towns haven't. And university towns are the same. And that's often to do with having a source of good employment in an area where you don't have it. That's where you get real problems. So it comes all all comes back in the end, to jobs, jobs and jobs. And you have a report coming out with Ernst & Young on foreign direct investment. Yep. Tell us about that. So it's really hard to talk about foreign direct investment without people falling asleep. And in fact, Maria's just fallen asleep. So, (laughs) And she's foreign. (laughs) (laughs) No comment. I'm Um, not asleep. We'll we'll just stop you when we're bored. Okay. (laughs) Are you bored yet? No, go. (laughs) Fuck. So the report with Ernst & Young is about the proportion of foreign direct investment that is coming into different areas of the country. And we found exactly the same pattern. In fact, it's quite dramatic. So the proportion of foreign direct investment going to cities has grown hugely over the last 20 years. The proportion going to towns has fallen very sharply. And in those post-industrial towns, the proportion of foreign the percentage of foreign direct investment that's going in has fallen by 74% in the last 20 years. So this is a huge gulf and it comes back to the same thing that the CBI told us when we formed a couple of years ago. It's about investors feeling that they can't invest because the infrastructure isn't there. And that comes directly back to politicians and the impact of political decisions that are having a major impact on which areas benefit from this new globalised economy and which areas fall behind. When it comes to that, obviously, Britain is dominated in so many ways by London, in the same way that France is dominated by Paris. But then other countries, be it Germany or the United States, are far more spread out in terms of uh, in terms of their resources and with regards to cities. Would that help towns in this country, do you think, if uh, if Manchester became stronger, if Birmingham became stronger, et cetera, et cetera? Just a quick note on that. I don't think, I mean, you, you might have figures which I've not seen, but I don't think actually France is quite the same. Not, you're right. Not in, in it's not, in, it's not in the got, same league. Because as you were saying, because I think in France we do have cities that, okay, like, to give, I think, that quite specific example, I feel like, you know, in London, I know very, very few people my age or sort of, you know, in their kind of like mid, late 20s, early 30s, who would leave London now to go to, yeah, say, like Manchester or wherever else, or Birmingham. Whereas in France, I feel like I know quite a lot of people who might come from a city or town, whatever, probably go to Paris if you'd like to study for a bit or maybe to kind of, you know, boost their career for a few years. And then a lot of them are actually then moving back to cities at like the point where they want to buy and have kids and etc., which I think doesn't happen as much. So actually, yeah, no, I, I will defend France on that one. And I think, again, as you said, you know, with stronger cities, you do get stronger towns around them. So I would challenge that a bit just because I think that that's the model that hasn't really worked is the idea that if you boost the cities, then the surrounding towns feel the benefit. And that's a model that the last Labour government adopted. It's outlasted Labour all the way through George Osborne and the city devolution deals. And actually, where we've seen successful towns has been where they've been able to build on their own local assets and identity. So just to give you an example, very close to home in Wigan, we teach students from right across the Middle East, countries like Libya, at Wigan and Lee College, in engineering and the reason that we attract students from all over the world to come to Wigan and Lee College is we we still got that legacy of engineering skills from the mines even though they closed in the late 80s and early 90s we still have (laughs) well apparently not actually (laughs) yeah it's it's coming back and so there is still that legacy of skills there that's very very different to the sort of skills levels and the expertise and the strength and the assets that you would find in Manchester for example and so there has to be a plan that works for those towns and cities equally and doesn't see them as being absorbed into one whole. And I I think people do actually yearn to move back home. In my town, for example, under the last Labour government, there was a huge uh, boost to university education and a lot of young people went off to university for the first time. But when they looked back, they found that increasingly there was nothing to return home to. And that has been a source of real pain for a lot of families across the country. One of the 
business leaders who came to the CBI event that we did said to me that the, the story of the last 20 years for him had been the search to come home. And as his mum was getting older and he's, he'd had children himself, he was quite desperate about the fracture that existed in his family, but he couldn't move home to Wigan because the jobs just aren't there for the sort of work that he does. Now that is quite devastating when you consider the assets that exist in many of our towns around the country and that's why we're saying at the Centre for Towns that you need a complete reset and a completely different approach. There was also some really interesting research that was done at Sheffield University not very long ago. Fine, fine institution. That looked at the dominance of the City of London and what that's doing to our regions this is an assumption that unless you protect the city, then you can't protect tax revenues and public spending. So when you say the city, do you mean as in the financial yeah, district? Yeah. yeah. So the city of London rather than yeah. London itself. But the study was fascinating in that they concluded completely differently that actually the dominance of the city of London is what is squeezing the life out of other parts of our economy and in other geographical areas as well and this direction of travel that has gone from productive lending where the city underwrites other parts of the economy that are actually creating jobs um, and creating wealth and growth and the move away from that to the sort of unproductive lending lending for lending's sake and all the things that we saw in the run-up to the financial crash has actually caused real problems for those other parts of the economy and meant that they've stagnated rather than grown instead. And that is quite fascinating because it sends a very different message to politicians. We've been told over and over again that you can't have things like a financial transaction tax because it would hinder the city and that the only way that we can take action is through working hand-in-hand with other countries to try to rein in the power of capital but actually this study suggests that politicians in the UK can take unilateral action to try to rein in the power of capital unproductive capital because unless you do you squeeze the life out of other parts of the economy and so it takes you down a completely different route in terms of politics and regulation um, and economic management and industrial strategy that is something that really hasn't been heard properly in Westminster, but ought to be. But so kind of like coming back, I guess, to Westminster, so, and you said you were cross-party, I guess. So have people been listening? Like have people, like you know, the Labour leadership or the Tory leadership actually been in touch? Or is that something people have started caring about in Westminster? Y- yes, yeah. and there's a reason for it. When we launched, we launched with a piece of research that showed that 33,000 votes in just a handful of town constituencies switching from Tories to Labour would have handed Jeremy Corbyn the keys to number 10 in 2017 and Will Jennings and Will Brett at the New Economics Foundation also did a piece of research that looked at how in many of those areas where towns will determine the outcome of the general election Labour is actually going backwards. So places like Amber Valley, Calder Valley, Bolton, where we nearly lost the council in 2018. Mm. And so there's a renewed focus in Westminster on this because people's jobs depend on it, frankly, and the Mm. outcome of the next election will be determined in those small and medium-sized towns. Cities are now overwhelmingly dominated by Labour. The countryside is overwhelmingly dominated by the Conservatives. And so there is a renewed focus on small and medium-sized towns, not just in Labour, who have set up a unit to try and look at how we win back our towns. You've got John McDonnell, who's been on a tour. He talked about politicians going on tours. It's not a t- propaganda tour, is it's, it? Uh, it's not a propaganda tour. Is or it a, a fact-finding mission? Oh my God. A listening tour. It's a, a listening, listening tour. tour. Yeah, it's a listening great. tour. That's right. But you've also got people in the Conservative Party, people like Robert Halfen, Neil O'Brien, James Cleverley, who've been really interested in this area of work and have been trying, I think, with some frustration to get it onto the agenda for the Tories as well. I mean, the Tory party conference this year was overwhelmingly dominated by Brexit. But actually, if you came to the Labour Party conference, I spoke at 18 fringe events about towns and uh, it was fascinating, I promise you. And it shows, actually, that the thing is starting to shift and that there is a renewed political interest in it. Now, you've worked with Will Jennings, Andy and Warren. Which one's your favourite? Without a doubt, Will (laughs) <laughs> controversial. I'm I'm more of an Ian person myself. Oh, yeah. MLC. I'd say Will. Uh, well, well, he does he does listen to the uh, he does listen to the podcast as, God, as does his wife and son. So uh, this is the end of the centre for towns. We'll never be allowed back into the shed again. Can I t- can I change my vote? <laughs> no, no, no. What's done is done. Lisa, 
I'm sure you like a Sunday roast. I'm a vegetarian, actually. F***ed that, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Lisa, you're a vegetarian. <laughs> what percentage of people do you think would choose a vegetarian option for their Sunday roast? Probably none. None? That's not playing the game. Oh, sorry. What am I meant to you say? You have number. I'm sorry, yeah. what is it? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone would think you haven't listened to this podcast before. What do you think the proportion of I British don't. people is who choose vegetarian options for Sunday roast? Uh, 3%. 3%. MLC, what do you think? 17%. Oh, I'm afraid you're both wrong by some distance. It's actually 8%. So in between... Oh, uh, in between I, was quite, two of I thought we were both quite oh, close, actually. Yeah. Uh, outside the margin of error. What do you, what do you think <laughs> What do you think is the most popular meat for Not Sunday beef, roast? Surely. Yeah, beef. Yes, you're right, you're right. The roast beefs. Is, is that really what French people call us? Yeah. Okay. It was beef. <laughs> yes. In well, one word, actually, funny enough, like we spell it R O S B I F. Well, beef. well, it's accurate. Thirty-three percent choose beef. Twenty-seven percent choose uh, choose chicken. Is it true in France that you have a saying about calling a cat a cat instead of a spade a spade? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, another one you might like is that Trivial Pursuit, the triangles. We actually call them camemberts which I thought every country did, like the round things, <laughs> until like, I said it, French Triple Pursuit in the UK, and everyone was like, the what now? <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, no, surely that's a joke. Surely French people don't literally call the Triple Pursuit round things. Come on, bears. And it's like, no, we do. We call them cheeses, don't we? No. We do in my family, and sort of the, the two times we've played it that have both ended in mindless violence. <laughs> And so thinking again about your Sunday roast, Lisa, what do you, what do you, what do you have with your uh, what do you have with your Sunday roast? Roast potatoes. Roast potatoes yeah. that yeah, 89% choose that. Uh, this is like that um pointless game. It's a bit like that, yes, with a tall person sitting down um, talking about random stats. And it is quite pointless. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh, harsh, harsh crowd, harsh crowd. Lisa, thanks very much. Uh, there was no time for our interview with Mark Zuckerberg, but I understand we might be able to get him on Facebook Messenger. Just time for a quick look inside Lisa's shed. I'm not allowed in this shed after you made me answer that question about Ian and Will. <laughs> yeah, uh, the door is locked. Thank you to Subject Bakshi. This episode was sponsored by Smarkets. Thanks very much. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Please remember to like, subscribe, review, all these different things that help people uh, hear about us. And do tell all of your friends and many of the people that you don't know, uh, even if you haven't enjoyed the podcast. This is a Podo podcast produced by Nick Hilton, and our theme tune is by Joe Button. For more details, go to podopods.com, and for sales and advertising, email nick at podopods.com. And yes, that's spelled P-O-D-O-T-P-O-D-S dot com.